my piece. The Seattle Storm just got a lot better. So let's talk about it. This Saturday edition of Locked Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Welcome. You are locked on women's basketball. My name is Tim Cruz. I'm the Saturday host covering the WBA draft, rookie scale contract players, and contribute to our prospect scouting at the next. Thanks for making Locked Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Remember, Locked Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. I am joined by my co-hosts, M. Adler and Lincoln Schaefer. M. covers the WNBA in the New York market and heads our written coverage of the WNBA draft at thenextgroup.com. And Lincoln is an indispensable part of our scouting team. You can follow him at Dovienia underscore on Twitter. So on Friday afternoon, it was announced by R.M. Adler and further contribution from our team at the Knicks that talented wing Gabby Williams would re-sign with the Seattle Storm in the coming days and um, join the team in the coming weeks as well. So I'll give the floor to you, M, to just give a quick synopsis on how this was possible, given that Gabby was playing overseas and she is coming late to the season. Yeah, so... Now that you mentioned it, I actually realized that there was a piece of reporting that I had completely forgotten to include in the piece by itself, which was I, t- I talked one-on-one with uh, the Seattle Storm general manager, Talisa Rea, over the offseason, and I asked about Gabby's availability coming into this season, because we had all known, looking at prioritization, that there would be some issues with some different leagues in terms of the fact that different leagues in Europe that a lot of players play into the offseason, these different leagues end at different times. And so some of them are going to be very convenient for feeding back into um, for feeding back into WNBA training camps. Usually this is not a big case with the WNBL in Australia. It, players leave at the right time, they get to WNBA training camp and they get as much time as they feel that they're going to need. You can run into some issues with Turkey and Hungary if people are going late into the season. France is the one that always is an issue. And Gabby has always played with the French uh, league. She has been on a number of different teams there. She is a French national at this point. Um, so, she, or sorry, she has French nationality. She's American national. She has French nationality as well. And she was the MVP of the French league uh, in 2022. So we knew that this was going to be an issue. I talked with Talisa Ray in the off season. And what she told me at the time that was quite surprising was that they did not expect to have any issue with Gabby uh, coming back. They didn't expect there to be any problem, any unforeseen, any big unforeseen circumstances regarding whether or not they could resign her and whether or not she would contribute to the team uh, this come this current season. It was a bit surprising at the time, and it pretty quickly became clear that Gabby wasn't going to be getting to Seattle, you know, in time for training camp. So it would have been basically right before the start of the French playoffs. So based on that, it was basically clear that they had some plan to do some machinations in the middle of the season. Noel Quinn, Storm head coach, had said at different points throughout the season that she was mostly decently optimistic that they were working with Gabby Williams and that there was a decent possibility that they could deal with her. You know, she's more focused on the roster at hand. There was there was some complication. I'm not going to get into it here. You can, re- you can read the article for this sort of narrative and how it played out, but there was some complication in terms of Gabby Williams' health and the exact timing of the playoffs and when she did and did not play that made it a little unclear whether or not she was even going to stop playing by the deadline that the CBA laid out that you had to stop playing in order to not be suspended for the WNBA season. But, you know, to skip over all that, to make a long story short, she stopped playing by that deadline. And basically for the past month or so, you know, the Noe has said a couple of times that they were still optimistic about signing her and her playing this year, but it, there really wasn't any movement on her end of it. She, until she popped up in New York last week, we saw some posts, we saw, some, we saw a couple Instagram stories, and then that sort of crescendoed to the storm releasing Royal Garantis last night. And you know, as soon as we saw that, it's an open spot for a team that has a lot of cap space uh, to fill that last spot with. We asked around, and it turns out Gabby Williams is back. All right, so let's get to the basketball. So for you, Lincoln, <laughs> What does this mean for the Storm right now? They're in fringe playoff contention right now with a number of teams, but um, this definitely brings them 
above teams like Minnesota, um, for example. Yeah, for sure. It's adding another like really smart basketball player and uh, an elite athlete and wing defender uh, who kind of is like almost perfect to serve as almost a role model for someone like Jordan Horston to model her game after uh, someone who comes in, plays defense, uh, keeps the ball moving offensively. She makes good reads. She uh, has struggled with shooting the ball as a pro, but um, you know, that, that mold of a solid wing defender, who's a good rebounder, a good connective passer and, who just makes things happen on the court is an important thing for everyone in the league to have. And this is going to make the already solid perimeter defense for the storm uh, even better and uh, more like at a higher level for a team that's kind of in flux right now. There is the possibility that, I can't even say the possibility. There is a likelihood that sooner rather than later, if the storm front office has its way, that we're going to be seeing starting lineups consisting of Ivana Jolikic, Jewel Lloyd, Gabby Williams, Jordan Horson, and Ezzy Magliber. Not only is that crap ton of length, that is all an incredible amount of disruptive defensive activity, both at the point of attack and on the back side of the team. You know, they the, the storm, when they're clicking, they run a defensive system wholly unique among, really among any professional basketball team, at least in the United States, in just level of activity, the level of aggression, the amount of communication and rotation that they that they take, it's sort of a modern variant of an SOS defense, and it's really built for the modern, for, for modern basketball in a way that we're going to see, I'm excited to see if they can clean up a little bit from the past, from the past couple of games, excited to see when they go to Connecticut, and when they play New York a couple times, um, both both uh, tomorrow and uh, I believe a week later uh, in Sunday on the East Coast. I'm going to get to see at least one of those games in person. It's a defense that operates by saying, you know, point of attack aggression, trapping, and essentially pre-rotating or operating in a system where they're, where instead of figuring out how to do rotations in the way that, you know, most WNBA hedge teams have to provide help, they basically say, we're, we're going to play already in rotation but we just kind of have to know where we're going. And they've had a lot of problems figuring out where everyone's going. You can see that both because they're a, they're a team that's young and a team that's playing most of its first games together and a team that is losing and it's been hard to build chemistry because this is a system that is hard to play. You put in Gabby Williams there, who was, you know, independent of positional value, in my opinion, the best or no worse than the second best defender in the league last year, who knows this system and knows how to, just had to wreck stuff up, that starting lineup could be so, so good. All right, so I'm going to bring it to a break, and then after I want to pose a question to both of you on just where Seattle stands overall with this, with the how the league is, um, how the league is flowing right now, the standings and everything. But um, first, we're going to go to a break. All right, so right now with how the WNBA standings are shaking up, there is four teams, I would say four teams, in contention for that last playoff spot between the Minnesota Lynx, they're 6-9 and nine right now, Atlanta is 5-8, and eight, Indiana 5-10, and 10, Seattle 4-11. and 11. So right now for you guys, if you had to bank on it, who are you picking for, to get that eight spot right now? I just want to say first, in terms of what you're saying about the, the setup of the standings of the league, to, to provide some context for that, we have the top four teams that everyone expected coming into the season. Aces, Sun, Liberty, Mystics, not necessarily in that order. That's not the point. And then there's a clear gap in the standings and in debt ratings, whatever, whatever measure you want, to everyone else. You have the, the wings and the sparks follow them. Your, your teams that are tied for the fifth seed, they're both a game under 500. Just three and a half games separate them and the very last place Mercury. The, the, the Dream and the Fever are both, like, they have looked like uh, crap, to be honest, uh, over the past couple weeks, and yet they are two games out of the five seed. 
Yeah, this was always kind of what I imagined the standings to look like when you have teams as talented as Vegas, Connecticut, uh, New York, and Washington. Like, when you have those four teams that are going to be eating up a lot of wins and not taking as many losses, it's going to skew the rest of your standings to look a little funky. Uh, And honestly, I think that any team between 7 and 11 right now could end up in the 7 spot or the 11 spot. Uh, that kind of parity, it it depends on team health because multiple teams that are in that mix have really struggled with injuries uh, through the first month, month and a half of the season. Uh, especially Chicago is just trying to find anything in the front court that works for more than a few games at a time. Uh, and you see like Minnesota and Atlanta kind of scrambling and I, I really have no idea what's going to happen with the 7, 8, 9, 10 area. It, it really could go any way. Yeah, because Minnesota doesn't have Jess Shepard, Tiffany Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Atlanta doesn't have their point of attack defender in Ari McDonald. Um, Indiana's just kind of there. I mean, they're probably kind of <laughs> happy with their spot. Like, 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 this is a better start than they had last season. They're in a better position than they are now. Having a, Leah Boston, all-star starter. So, for them, I think – they're just kind of flowing right now. Um, I know they've lost three straight, but I think they've had some flashes. Similar to Atlanta, they have had some flashes whenever they won those two games on the road. Um, we're pretty impressive that then now they're kind of going back down. Just There's so many teams that you're just either getting a really good game or a really bad game from, and um, that's, that's going to be the most interesting part for how this season continues to flow. If Seattle can get back into the playoff contention or if they're just – kind of too late, you know, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, that's the interesting thing for me is, you know, like I said with the things, I don't think it's, I don't think you can say with anyone, I mean, heck, even the Phoenix Mercury, again, they're just two and a half games out of a playoff spot somehow. The, it, it's not really too late for anyone, especially when we've seen what Seattle can do, which is, you know, beat up on most of these teams that are outside the top four or five in the league. The, the the particularly interesting thing for me is the sort of opposite spots where you look at where Los Angeles and Atlanta are. Los Angeles has been absolutely decimated by injury this year. They lost Necker for a few games early on, but she's been back and has been great since. But they've but basically right as soon as she came back, they they lost Claire, uh, Leisure Clarendon for uh, I think about a month and a half, two months was the original diagnosis, and we're about you know maybe two thirds of the way through that, which wouldn't be a huge loss uh, at its face, but they also just were relying so much on that three spot that they were playing at for playmaking. They have lost Lexi Brown uh, a couple weeks ago to what was a non COVID illness and has continued persisting. And they've completely lost so much of that shooting and that gravity. They were running so many plays for her. She was frankly the main focus of their, of their set play offense. And she's been out for them. They have, very, very sorely missed a lot of really important leverageable bodies for them. And it's pretty incredible that they're still at the five seed as they are, but I would bet on them pretty solidly being, if not the five seed, the fifth best team in the league once they get health after the all-star break. My concern on the other hand, you know, look at looking at Atlanta, they were healthy for most of the season. They had pretty much everyone they you know, needed to rely on. And since the only real notable loss has been Ari McDonald, which obviously a notable loss in and of itself. But it's not – sorry, early in the season they were missing Daniel Robinson, but that's not a big needle mover. You would expect with most of the core, if you have one of those two point guards available, it shouldn't be such a big loss from not having the other one that you're in the place here where you're three games under 500, you're tied with the Indiana Fever. Now, I, they, this comes with a grain of salt. They played one of the most difficult schedules in the league. I think by Massey they are number two or three in terms of strength of schedule. So far, they've played New York three times. They've played Washington and Vegas once each. They played Connecticut twice. Not a lot of teams and not a lot of teams have played such elite talent in the league. they have I think they've learned things about them, themselves. Hunter, you could speak to that more. But it is, but I think it's certainly disappointing that for as healthy as they've mostly been, that we're here with them. Yeah, and maybe yeah. the most, uh, the thing that m- makes it, so such an interesting race for that eight seed is that all of those teams eight through 12 have someone playing it like in all WNBA level for Minnesota. You have Nafisa Collier having 
a resurgence, maybe the best year of her career. She just scored 33 points the other day. You have uh, Ryan Howard and Alicia Gray on the dream. You have Aaliyah Boston playing out of her mind well as a rookie. And in Seattle, you have Jewel Lloyd, who just dropped 41 in an overtime loss. And, it's such and, of, course, and of course, Brittany Griner is like just a matchup problem for every single person who steps on the court against her and just and it's also part of the issue with her that she's missed a few games and, and that really scared them there's just so much talent in those eight to 12 spots that makes it so unpredictable yeah and getting back to atlanta they i don't, I don't think they've played either of phoenix or seattle yet this season who are bottom two in the standings so they whenever that whenever they do get seattle they're probably going to be getting the best version of seattle and also the best version of phoenix now that they're kind of changing things up as well. So Atlanta is a kind of a tricky spot right now where, yeah, Atlanta's in a tricky spot right now, just in terms of how this season has flowed for them. Because I think heading into the season, we kind of expected that the offense would be kind of worse, just given that some of what they have, and we, because defense is supposed to be kind of like the, the main thing. That was the main thing for them last season, but this season they've taken a big drop up on defense. Um, the transition defense has been pretty brutal. Um, the offense has been good. Alicia Gray has been like an all-star caliber player, like Lincoln said, but it's just been figuring out how to defend, how to play consistent basketball, which is just, it just seems like, okay, every other game, it's kind of the same stuff being said, you know, like, oh, we got to play a better transition defense. Then they kind of clean it up. They're bad at the same spot again. So I think, I think for Atlanta, um, I think they're either going to get like the fifth spot or they're going to fall to the playoffs, like fifth or sixth spot. I just don't see Atlanta just staying in the middle unless Aaron McDonald comes back and she's just, really good they're just really really good because prior to her injury she wasn't great offensively I know she was pretty stifling at the point of attack on defense but um yeah I'm, I'm interested to see where Atlanta goes because they've got the star power um very suspect bench in terms of just having versatility and different skill sets but uh, yeah I think that's where I'm at on Atlanta right now yeah and I I, I mean I think the thing for me as it you know, plays the dream. I think it's more likely just given that talent, you know, that that you'd see them stay middling than you know completely drop off. It's it's hard for me to see them at the end of the season much behind Chicago if at, if they don't pass them by that point. It's hard for me to see them not at the same level as Indiana. It's hard for me to see them you know behind Seattle, that sort of thing. I I, I think the thing that's mostly stood out the it, it you know you can lose to teams that are as good as the top three or four in the league are but it's to me it's the margins that have happened real recently the cup the uncompetitive loss to new york last week the really bad loss to the mystics as well you had you, you had a couple bad showings against um or not a couple you, you, had, you had the bad showing against connecticut as well these aren't things that at this point in the season should be happening even with aaron mcdonald out there, there's got to be signs of moving in a direction where when she comes back it's it's more it's more additive than than rescuing. Yeah, like even some of those losses, like the one against Las Vegas was like a blowout. They came back late. Then also the recent one, um, their, their last previous game, just these games weren't super competitive until late. They just kind of came back in it late, um, which is another story. But after the break... I mean, hell, they're t- I mean, hell they've lost to Dallas twice and their two games against the Fever were each like two possession games. Right, yeah, that, that, was, that was rough. But... Um, after the break, we'll kind of tease our new podcast series coming next Saturday um, here on Locked Women's Basketball. And we're back. I'm your host, Cruz. I'm appreciate for making Locked Women's Basketball your first listen every day. So like I said, next Saturday we'll be debuting our new podcast series, WNBA Retrospect, a historical WNBA scouting series where we'll go through old full game film starting in 1997, reading articles from the time, speaking to people in the industry and cranking the numbers to come to a stronger conclusion on our thesis, aka who is the best WNBA prospect of all time. This idea came to us a few months back watching Caitlin Clark cook defenses on a nightly basis, just given how great of a prospect she is, trying to compare what she's done to past prospects and see where that stacks up in totality against over just over the 25 plus years of WNBA draft prospects entering the league. 
Season one, episode one, will cover the great Tina Thompson, the WBA's first draft selection out of college and a key member of the legendary Houston Comets dynasty. And as usual, each episode will be made available on our on your preferred podcasting platform and YouTube. So yeah, we appreciate you making Luckman's basketball your first listen today. And I make now join us for our continued WNBA coverage next week. Have a terrific weekend, everyone.